you want to do uh, Sure. Yeah. Sweet. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right. Um, they want us to do a little housekeeping here before we kick things off. Um, so before we begin, uh, there is a networking reception at 5 at the LDI Circle Bar today, so don't miss that. Uh, Battle of the Busk competition, uh, which is at 6 p.m. in the same place, LDI Circle Bar. And then um, Crew Up and Connect Industry Party from 6 to 8 at the LDI Circle Bar, same location. And then After Dark at Omnia at Omnia Nightclub, and that starts at 10.30. So plenty of uh, events to keep you busy tonight if you're so inclined. So. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah, we're ready to go. So uh, our talk today is uh, New Frontiers, the Convergence of AI, Sensors, and Digital Technology. I'm Vincent Casey. I'm Pete Erickson. It's us. Sweet. So AI, what is it? Uh, machines simulating a known process or definition. That's the fancy word. Basically just means uh, making computers do people things. So things that we standardly think of like what people would uh, calculate or write without like a no mechanical process, that's what AI does. Uh, what types of AI are there? So from a consumer's perspective, uh, you have generative and there's predictive. I'm going to focus on predictive today. Peter's going to focus on generative. Technically speaking, they're all predictive, but we're not going to get into that today. What is predictive AI? Predictive AI takes in a whole bunch of uh, standard kind of physical world inputs. So that can be visual, audio, uh, textual. So that would be like content in like phrases, or can even be like logistics. So number of people per hour, number of like items going through a like a market, items purchased per hour, um, and it takes all that information and then spits out some other relevant information. So you can take pictures of a road and then count on the vehicles. That would be AI detecting the vehicles and then uh, counting it up for a predictive measurement. So how can you apply this to signage? Uh, several different ways. You have consumer demographic statistics. That's something that I've worked a decent amount on. That would be like tracking people, demographics. Um, this could be useful if you're trying to figure out, hey, uh, what kind of people are actually looking at our signage? How does this affect our marketing? How does this affect uh, what kind of technologies do we use? Are they actually paying attention to our signage? Uh, these are all very important aspects when you're actually trying to design your software, when you're trying to design hey, uh, what kind of marketing material is most uh, most usable in this kind of area, uh, physically and even like uh, locationally and all that. Uh, some other aspects that can happen uh, for this are trend and uh, trend prediction and analysis. So that would be like, if you already have that demographic data, um, can you predict uh, what times of day do certain people go to your stores? What kind of what times a day do certain groups of individuals go and walk past your signage? Um, and you can use that, again, for marketing materials and whatnot. Um, as you can imagine, this can be very useful, but there are some uh, ramifications to that. You're not allowed to do identification in any part of the US, US on a private sector, unless if you have signed uh, warrants. So if you have a person sign, hey, you can take a picture of me and identify me, then you're allowed to. Otherwise, you can't identify them. You can make uh, predictive assessments, so like age, uh, gender, and whatnot, things that you can see, but you're not allowed to identify them in any way. Uh, object and brand identification. This is very, very useful if you want to see if there's customer loyalty. Uh, if people who wear or drive certain brands of vehicles or clothing uh, pay more or less attention to your signage uh, to different marketing materials that you have. It's not something that might be immediately apparent, but if you can try to uh, tie uh, if certain groups of people who drive, let's say Toyotas, are looking for Fords, it might not be something that uh, is directly apparent, but it might be something that or like, hey, if I have a little bit more extra money, I might be looking to buy a different type of truck. Um, 
uh, and again, this is more on predictive AI. Um, it, this does, it can add value to your product. Um, it does come at a cost. Uh, developing in-house is a very expensive process, but if you go via a contract through an outside party or using an out-of-box solution, those can cut costs uh, significantly, very, very significantly. The actual development of a model itself can go anywhere from the millions to billions of dollars uh, from scratch. Uh, whereas you can go into fine-tuning processes uh, or other methods which actually take a pre-existing model and can be adapted towards your personal needs. And those can uh, cut costs significantly by tens to hundreds of times uh, cheaper than what you can generally find for a uh, standard process. Uh, also, running on-site versus in the cloud. Um, there's lots of pros and cons to this. Uh, running on-site, obviously, uh, it can only work for smaller models, things that might not be able to do all the fancy things like uh, uh, chat GPT. That's all running in the cloud. Uh, running in the cloud is a bit more expensive up front because it actually depends on having servers and actual locations to build. But running on-site means that you don't have to worry about uh, nearly as much server fees or any of that. Um, AI cloud fees are much more expensive than standard uh, cloud software fees, such as databases or, um, if you're familiar with AWS, uh, Lambda processes. Um, so that would be something that you want to keep in mind when you're actually running these processes. How does it add value to your product? So again, it's very powerful very expensive. Um, adding value can sometimes be indirect, especially with predictive AI. Um, it might not have that upfront flashy, hey, we're going to make this thing look 10 times better or be 10 times cheaper to produce for some marketing material. But in the long run, if you're using trends analysis, for example, if you're able to have that marketing material shown at different times of day where it's even 5% more effective, that's a significant bump in what could be uh, more effective advertising. Uh, and again, this is uh, just going off of what I was talking before of developing in-house contract out of the box. Uh, again, in-house, very expensive. You have to build a team. You have to have like experts actually do this um, contract work. Um, this is pretty standard and is Usually what you'll be, will probably be looking for, um, either that or out of the box solutions. Contract work means that you generally have the fine tuning process of some of the very expensive models that are out there. So uh, I don't know, like YOLO for example, where you can take an image and then you can look for certain things in that image. And that can be like, uh, right now the standard is usually like people or vehicles, but you can find that, fine tune that down to brands, watches, uh, coffee brands, whatever you have, and that would be 100 times cheaper than building it from scratch. Um, out of the box, that's also a lot cheaper. Uh, in fact, probably the cheapest option on here. However, it's very limited in what it can actually do due to um, it being out of the box. It doesn't have that flexibility of uh, being able to identify certain brands, for example most solutions at least. And this is going off of on-site or in the cloud, um, what I went and talked about before. Uh, here are some examples of, uh, on the right, that's a standard YOLO uh, model running, and then on the left is a fine-tuned YOLO model. Um, YOLO being the AI recognition um, image recognition. So the right is people, vehicles. On the left, it's looking for uh, retail items. And that's my segment. Awesome. Thanks, Vince. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. My name is Pete Erickson. Again, I work for Screenfeed, and I do uh, kind of the creative stuff at the company. So I'm gonna kind of transition from the predictive side of, of AI and talk more about the generative AI, uh, applications of AI when it comes to creating content. Um, as, as a content creator myself, so I'm kind of coming at it how uh, how I'm using it, how I, I see it, where I see it going. So, um, real quick, can can I just get a quick show of hands if you are 
a, a creative, where you find yourself doing creative work in your daily daily workflow. All right, awesome, nice. And then uh, keep your hand up if you have already begun to use some of these tools in your your regular workflow. Nice. Okay. Cool. So it might be might be somewhat uh, known by you uh, already, but that uh, should be fun here. So uh, first I'm going to get into three different creation categories as it re regards generative AI tools. Um, we'll talk about generative text, generative visuals, and generative design. Um, so generative text, again, as, as Vince mentioned, you've got an input, which is text, and you're getting text back. Um, so a few different uh, kind of bigger players that are out there right now using these, these resources for their product. Um, you got OpenAI, who's got ChatGPT, which you've no doubt heard about. Um, Canva, uh, a little over a year ago, rolled out a big suite of, of features under their magic uh, tool set. Um, and so they've got uh, generative text that you can use uh, under their, their product, uh, Grammarly. And then also, uh, if, if this then that has a lot of trigger, trigger set up so that you can um, you can trigger a prompt and it will you know, tell it to write a blog post and it will create the blog post, drop it in a Google Doc and outline it all for you um, as an example. Um, so what a, lo a lot of I'd say creators are using it for nowadays um, is getting I coming up with ideas. So if you're in marketing and you need ideas for a campaign, you might drop a prompt in like that on the top and you might get something back like that below. Um, it's truncated there, so it's not the whole thing, but it then give you a list of ideas for how to structure a campaign. So you're getting some text ideas back. Um, you, you can use it to help you draft uh, things like emails or um, you know, write CTAs or um, you know, product promotional descriptions. Um, you know, for this example, you know, if you're a customer service rep, you need to write a short, short, polite email for a very specific case. Um, say you've gotten an email request from a customer, you can actually, I believe, grab that email from the customer, drop it in so that it has that context, and get. And that's another, I guess, a side thing. These tools are great at summarizing chunks of text uh, to kind of so you can kind of TLDR. You don't have to read the whole thing, but it'll give you some something to go on um, in that regard. So you can kind of see what and it'll actually draft a draft an email for you. And then lastly, it uh, it can do some coding. I'm not a coder myself, so I don't want to overpromise on this. Uh, I like uh, Adobe After Effects is a, a, a app that I use a lot, um, and one of the best powerful features in that um, in After Effects is uh, there's a, like a almost like a its own coding language called Expressions, and you can use these expressions to automate and um, kind of handle a lot of tedious stuff uh, on your design that that otherwise you couldn't do. So an example would be, like you see here, um, say I've got a bit of text on screen and I want a box to always be around it and I want to be able to reuse that text and have it you know, be different words. So as the, the width and the shape of that word block changes, I can write an expression for the container rectangle that goes around it to kind of ship, uh, to uh, readjust, resize to fit that word. Um, and so I, I would use an expression to do that. Now I personally don't have you know this kind of language memorized. It's not enough of a, my regular workflow that I can just kind of you know hammer it right out. Um, I could certainly look it up online, but you know those are that even takes some you know minutes I'd say to get that going. Whereas you know I could tell ChatGPT exactly the expression I'm looking for, even using the layer names that I have in my project file, and it's going to give me the code that's if not exactly what I need, pretty pretty close. Um, so it's a really nice shortcut to be able to come up with some of those uh, those bits of expressions for things like After Effects. And I, I, if you're a developer, you might maybe you've played with this and having it write you know some some front end code yourself and found some some success potentially too. But that's uh, generative text. Um, moving on to generative, and I'm going to move quickly. It's kind of a lot to cover, so <laughs> bear with me here. Uh, generative visual assets, you've pr no doubt seen you know, examples of this, but um, using a prompt to get a visual something back in return. And so um, again, you're going to see kind of some of these platforms used a lot. Uh, again, OpenAI open has their DALI uh, model. Canva has their own image model. Um, Midjourney is the ships there. 
And then Adobe Fire, Firefly is their AI tool that they're using to generate images. Um, and then Google even has uh, some interesting things going on with, uh, with generative images and video, which I'll kind of get to in a, in a little bit. Um, but again, the idea is you type in a prompt and you get usually at least three different kind of takes on what you've prompted it to do. So you can kind of pick, take the one you like or tell it to start over. Um, so I'll, we'll kind of do some example prompts here, like a wide angle of photograph of coastal cliffs at sunset with pine trees. Sounds nice. And uh, yeah, not too bad. I mean, that's, that's from, uh, from Dolly. Uh, and you could refine the prompt to tell it, you know, make it nighttime, have the moon in the sky, have the landscape on the left side instead. Um, so it it's, it's, does a pretty good job of generating scenes like this, I'd say. Um, what I find really interesting, interesting is Adobe has um, begun adding in Adobe Illustrator. If you do any sort of vector work in your graphic design, um, you can generate vector artwork right within Illustrator, which is uh, for a, a not terribly artistic designer. I'm, I'm a little more analytical, but it's I find it extremely helpful to just kind of create uh, scenery, which I'll show you here. Um, so you can see the prompt, and I kind of highlighted that word pixelated uh, to say that you can use different style terms to kind of get a, you know, a different result based on the same description just by tweaking some very small style words. So I could use, uh, you know, add in like a, a minimalist style or uh, line art or um, you know, I could say use a, use a grayscale color scheme. Uh, you know, you, oh, there's a lot of potential there. And you basically just define the area, tell Illustrator to fill it in with what you want, and it'll do that. You can even, once you've created something, you can say you want to add an eagle to this guy in the same style it can do that for you too. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. And it's all vector too, which is really exciting. Um, very cool. Uh, lastly, for video, I don't have the actual video sample, but it's a screen grab. Uh, Google has a model called Imagine, or Imagine. It's probably one of those tech words we'll fight over how to actually pronounce it. But um, you can type in a prompt and it will generate a short video clip of what you've prompted. So this, you can kind of imagine like the time lapse style of you know, you saw them in science classes, little plants growing up before your eyes. And it looks pretty good. Um, you can, it looks like that pretty much the whole way, but growing up. Uh, comes out at about 1280 by 768, I think this clip came out. So it's not full HD, but, and, it, and it's an MP4. You can just download it for free and it's, you're off running. So again, this is kind of where we're at now and it's only going to get better. So that's fairly, fairly exciting, I think. All right, moving on to generative design. Kind of gave it that subtitle because uh, I think that's the most realistic way to look at generative design. Um, you, you, you don't expect it to hammer out the whole layout of a of a you know a advertisement for soda or energy drinks. Um, it, it depending on what you do, it's going to give you a good place to start. So, um, kind of show you the platforms using it here. Uh, Adobe Express, um, which is kind of their non-designers design app uh, for people cranking out a lot of social media graphics. Um, it's kind of their Canva, I, I guess I would say, to, for lack of a better description. And then Canva obviously has, has this tool as well. Um, and actually the slides that you're looking at, um, I did do a prompt for, you know, design a, a deck for a presentation on AI and digital signage content. And it, this is kind of, not the, the substance of the presentation isn't what it gave me, but the look and feel of the slides is actually what it's based on. So if you like the way that looks, that's where it came from. Um, so it's kind of a little meta fun little thing there. Um, the thing to note with, with, with these resources though, with both Adobe Express and Canva, um, it's giving you results based on their own internal database of templates and design files that they've been you know, stockpiling for you know, the years that they've been doing it and people have been pour, pouring into it. Um, and while that might sound like kind of a glorified search engine, it's actually a little bit better than that because it's also, you know, again, it's using your prompt and any specifics you're giving it to use what it has, but also kind of infusing it what, with what you need. So colors, um, subjects, uh, you know, style cues. So again, if I, I, I think I did something like a clean design and it, so it's a fairly minimal uh, looking type of presentation. So those, those sorts of cues really will help get you what you need. Figma's there, kind of as an honorable mention. They've got some plugins that are uh, 
are supposed to let you uh, kind of get a head start on some website page design, even some help you design components. Uh, not a ton of what I do in uh, digital signage content design, but I think it's something to keep an eye on um, if you spend any time in Figma. Uh, it's always a fun app to use. So generative design. All right, I'm going to transition now into a few uses and applications that I think are notable um, for the creative process as, as a designer. Um, and especially working on digital signage content. So we'll jump into that next. All right, I think the one of the initial benefits is that it helps to enhance the creative process and it helps us as creatives to feel more free to make mistakes. Um, I, you know, I would say it, it just, there's more room to, to ideate, uh, imagine, which I think is a really good thing for, especially for creating digital signage content. Um, come a long way, I think, but there's always room for improvement, I think, you know, in, the, in terms of the aesthetics that we're creating for digital signage content. Um, so yeah, I, I would, you know, I, I, how it lowers the stakes for taking creative risks, I think if if you're a creative that is able to to make something like this, you know, this photorealistic rendering of crumpled paper on a city street, um, the, you know, you, you say you want to flesh this this concept out and pitch it to your to your team. Um, instead of pouring a ton of time into it, obviously it takes a minute, you know, a couple minutes to generate that from a prompt. Um, and I think the benefit comes where if you're a creative, the more time and effort you spend on a particular concept or a design, I think you uh, inherently get a little attached and maybe obsessed about it. Uh, maybe it skews your perspective on like if that's the the right concept for a pitch. Um, so the quicker that we're able to generate these ideas and, and multiple ideas, I think it, it creates a, a more a better situation for us to evaluate ideas and not be so, you know, clingy to making them making one particular one go. And I think especially for creatives who maybe aren't able to execute something at this level, it's it's huge because you're not tethered to where you happen to be at on a particular skill set. So if you don't know a three a three D creation software. Uh, but you have a great idea for something that's in 3D, you're now kind of free to like at least get that idea fleshed out in, in a pretty concrete, pretty good looking first take. Um, and that's, I think that's really powerful to help kind of level the playing field um, in terms of, you know, the ideas that we're generating, concepts and putting out just good ideas. So, um, yeah, that's, I'd say that's one big help uh, for enhancing the creative process. And uh, I think Again, it only helps to elevate the value of um, our imagination and, and using good taste and not necessarily having to think through the scope of like, can I actually make this? You know, like, can I can I actually execute this? Because I have this idea, I just don't know how to make it. So, um, so I think, you know, and it creates more room in the, you know, the scope of a project to be able to iterate and generate more ideas. You've got, you've carved out some more time. Uh, at least for now. So eventually, I'm sure the market's going to catch up, and they're going to shrink our timelines again anyway. So you know, maybe maybe enjoy it while it lasts. But uh, yeah. All right. So another benefit is I, th I think uh, these tools can really help us as creatives to be better at sales support. Um, you know, for the most part, as carefully crafted as our digital signage content designs are, they typically aren't going to see the light of day on an actual network until they've already been seen in a sales pitch or in a meeting room. Um, and so, you know, while I think sale, our sales teams are have a lot of grace and they, they want, you know, they expect something to be fully fleshed out and ready to roll from, a, the, from day one, as good as it can look, the better, you know? And if they can more effectively pitch and sell these things, then it's only better for, for us as designers too, just getting more, uh, more of that revenue coming in. Um, so I think you know this is, again is it represents uh, just good uh, opportunities to um, come up with better, more concrete pi uh, pitch assets for our for our sales teams to to put it, put out there when they're having those opportunities um, and to do it quickly because I don't you know rarely are there uh, pitch meetings that have uh, an ideal timeline you know usually as soon as possible is what I what I'm used to um, so yeah. All right, yeah, let's, let's just uh, sub note there. Um, this is a really, really specific benefit um, for, I think, creatives in digital signage. 
Um, a lot of times we're mocking up digital signage content. We want to show it in context of a, a waiting room or a lobby. And I don't know how many hours I've toiled on stock asset uh, sites trying to find an environment that's, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it's like se even 75% of the way there. And it's, it's hard, you know, it's like, it's, I think you know, if you're a photographer, you have to deal with access to these spaces. That's, that's, there's just not as much out there. So this is actually kind of in the wheelhouse for, for a lot of these uh, generative image models. They can generate a pretty nice looking space like this. Um, you kind of have that nice blank wall, which would be a nice place to stick a screen. Um, so again, normally something that would take 30 minutes on up to a, you know hours to find the right image. This is you know two or three minutes tops to find it. Um, I can even ask it to generate a screen to put on that space. Aspect ratio maybe not so great, but you know we're we're getting there. Uh, it's kind of nice just to be able to add on to to the image that it's already giving you. All right, so areas to explore is kind of some of the things that I'm uh, interested in with these tools. Uh, maybe you're looking into similar things, but um, with this improved image manipulation, um, specifically in Photoshop, being able to extend the the canvas size of a, of a particular image, um, you know, maybe you've got a templated uh, digital product where there's like you've got your your subject on the left side, but you need a lot of open space on the right for text and graphics to consistently fit. Um, so maybe you found the perfect picture, which happens to be this one, but obviously that image only goes so far. So um, it's great to be able to just kind of extend it. And again, with in Photoshop, you could do this. We've been able to do this for a while with like clone stamp, but I'd say with mixed results, at least I, I, I never feel super great using the clone stamp to do quite that much. <laughs> So it's great to be able to you know, extend it. You've got uniqueness in the crowd. The lines on the field are extended. And you've got your open space that you need for the graphics for that particular template. So, I, I, And how cool it would be if this could be, you know, if we can automate these sort of processes too, if you've got a digital product. So something I'm kind of interested in. Um, again, just another example. It would be nice to extend the sky on this one. Uh, I think sky gradients, let me just go back. Sky gradients are deceptively tricky to, to get right if you're adding on. You know, there's just enough nuance in the kind of the, the light to dark areas that it's it's hard to get it just right, and that does it really well, with, you know, without much of a seam. And then again, if you need to, um, you know, fill the sky with an, a an airplane, it can help you there too, just to kind of fill out that that composition. So, um, yeah, I'm getting there. Give you some closing closing thoughts here before we wrap up. Um, so some FYI, if you've spent any amount of time generating images of um, people in some of these generative models, you know that it, it can do a really good job of faces and you know forms, but you kind of see that on the right there, details like fingers and hands still remain a little bit of a sticking point. Uh, so we'll see if they, how and when they figure that out, but just something to be aware of if you're, if you're depending on this, you know, just to be, yeah, just user beware. Um, and we looked at, well, I, we didn't look at, but Things like architecture, um, it can do a, a decent job, you know, making a room, even kind of building this cool modern house here. Um, it's kind of thing you, at first looks pretty cool, looks pretty good, and then you start to look a little closer, and you know you've got some right angles aren't quite there, and you know the windows are a little different from each other. Um, you know, structural integrity of this actual place might be a little questionable. Um, so again, you know, it's like. It, you just got to keep in mind how much detail or true to life do you want these these sorts of assets to have because it's it's not gonna it's not gonna be perfect. But again, it's it's not bad. It's a pretty cool spot. Uh, visual words too. I don't. I, I I think they're still kind of figuring that out. Of like you know if there's like a sign in the background or text in the background of an image, it's getting there, but not super reliable to extend a sign in the background. Um, just so you know, AI models will fill in the blanks of a prompt if it doesn't know for sure what to tell you. Um, and that's why there's the disclaimer on chat GPT, you know, it's, don't take these as super factual, don't stake your life on it. It's for a reason, because it, it'll try to help you by any means necessary in some cases. Um, and then uh, if you're using a, a, a text-driven model, the more you may be digging into a prompt and kind of refining it, uh, it will eventually forget kind of 
the history of what you've talked about. Um, and so it'll, it can, that might create some confusing results at some point. So just know that it can only track with you for so long before it kind of forgets everything. So yeah, it's like a goldfish in that way maybe. Um, and then just a couple notes on prompts. Um, giving the model a role, if you remember some of the examples before, but if you, if you tell the model like you are an expert in a particular topic or subject, um, that'll help it to kind of just focus in on what you're probably looking for. So that's, that's an idea. Um, if you need brevity, you need to ask for it, because otherwise the models tend to be a bit wordy. Um, and in the same vein, they love lists. So if you don't want a list, note accordingly as well. But if you need a list, then you're in luck. There's going to be a lot, a lot of lists. Um, lastly, some limits to keep in mind. Uh, ChatGPT 3.5, which I believe is the free version, um, its last knowledge update was January 2022. So if you're needing your results to be, you know, keeping in mind of information or news or anything that's happened since then, uh, it's not going to have that to draw from. Uh, also, there are some safeguards in place over IP, like uh, song lyrics or scripts for movies and shows and things. Um, so if you happen, happen to want it to like script a new episode of The Bear for some reason, uh, it's not going to be able to, to do that. Um, you know, there's ways around it if you want to say, give me a script for a, a drama about the restaurant and industry, maybe it'll, if it actually the results then will probably, you'll probably see that it's referring to stuff that happens on that show, but in an indirect way, but it's something to keep in mind. Um, and then rules. It's kind of the wild west right now, but it's a very fluid state. If you're here in the US, uh, you've heard there's a lot of talk about legislation and laws being um, in, in the pipeline. It's still fairly open now, but it's really unknown how much longer. Um, Vince, you can probably confirm or not. I feel like I've heard that there's companies building servers like out in the middle of the ocean. Those like, are... <laughs> I don't know if that's like... Uh, they're theoretical. Okay. <laughs> Depends on what uh, legislature happens. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. So to avoid uh, those jurisdiction. anarchists are interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So something to keep an eye on if you're if you're especially if you're in, uh, integrating these sorts of tools into like any sort of like a product workflow where your business is depending on it, just know that things can and probably will change at some point. Um, just a few closing thoughts. Uh, again, that's kind of a really, really big, uh, broad stroke of a lot of things. We could, we could probably talk about any number of those things at length, but just wanted to kind of give a, a little bit of an overview. Um, overall, I'm, I think it's really interesting and exciting that these tools are existing and uh, that they're only going to get better is pretty amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to learn and, and keep up with, but um, I think the the thing is, like, if you're not already using these tools in your regular <coughs> workflow, they're just, whether you know it or not, they're going to be a part of your workflow. And uh, we're not far from these being very ubiquitous. And we'll probably chuckle that we even had this session, you know, in the near future, um, which, because it's going to be as just every day as, you know, the web, internet. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's what I've got. I'm going <laughs> to flip it over to our our uh, Q&A page and then our QR codes if you if you want to connect with us on LinkedIn. But um, let's see, I think yeah. we're at time. Uh, where are we? Yeah. Let yeah. <laughs> me start at 10.45. I think we've got a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah, we've got some yeah, time any questions. questions? Go for it. Uh, is both uh, Swooping and Rebel approved? The use of out-of-box solutions, or as you said, it's the Wild West, and you guys are trying to, even though they say maybe you shouldn't do it, you're like, I'll follow that, and you're still going to <laughs> play around with it. Yeah. What's the uh, regulation like, at work about this, what they're talking about? Uh, I mean, regulation is highly, it, it's usually just limiting the extremely large companies, and even then, it's not affecting their uh, customer base whatsoever. So. What you guys, like, with your clients, larger clients, right? When I'm saying large, I mean like. So you work for Rebel, like no. Still, no. You, you, you don't, don't have to worry about it. <laughs> yeah, we're still pretty early on. It's it's a lot of um, experimenting and kind of 
we're, we're still in R and D mode, I'd say a lot with with a lot of these these uh, these tools. But yeah, more to come. I was actually a beta tester for that. I had it two years earlier than everybody else. Um, from my experience, it was useful to a certain extent, but it made uh, subtle enough mistakes. So it looks perfect when you first see it. It might run perfectly for like the first two hours, but it made subtle enough mistakes where it would cause more issues in the long run because they'd have to go back and then change that code. Um, that, that, uh, that being said, um, as Peter said, <laughs> it's always improving. Um, who knows, like five years from now, I might never have to code again, which would be kind of bittersweet. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Yes? With all this being more along the lines of like tag images and things like that, how does that play into like the video spectrum? Like as far as what's available? Or? Yeah. There was actually a new model that released, I think, like four or five days ago. Um, it's basically what uh, the Google one was, but it's, I think it's almost HD level and up to five seconds. Um, I think OpenAI was the one that did it. Uh, again, it's just, it's very, it, it's almost exponential how fast this stuff is growing. So if it's not existing right now, it probably will in like four months. Yeah. Yeah, there's some interesting stuff if you're curious. Um, I've seen, I, I, I don't know that it's like a model for public use yet, but there's a, some folks used a model to create like a shot for shot remake of a perfume ad or something. And it's, it's really close, like it's pretty, it's pretty amazing to see. I think there's another one that they did like a, um, I think it's like a, like a Star Wars type of short film, but in the, the style of a, like a Wes Anderson film. Um, so that, that was. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. It's really cool. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's visually very interesting. But yeah, I have not a ton that's accessible for use yet. Do you find you're using a lot of stuff to get started or to like build on stuff that you already have? Because it seems like a lot of it is to get started, or you have an idea and try to end it in that form. Or are you finding use to actually complete and or build on top of the mm -hmm. Yeah, that, it's uh, yeah, very much to get started, and I think um, I haven't gotten there yet, but there's the potential to like scale out and and kind of use what, I, what what we've already created as kind of the the basis of creating more. Like the potential there is is certainly close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. Also, like the co-pilot uh, you mentioned earlier, which is a code generating uh, text AI. So you'll put in a prompt and it will write code. Uh, very similar thing. Uh, maybe do something short to get you started, but you're always going to need some refinement at the end. With time, I have noticed that I needed less and less refinement, but there will always be just a little bit I'll have to do. Anybody else? All right. Well, we're good to go. Yeah. Um, yeah. Everybody, uh, don't forget the yeah. events that were going on tonight. Uh, hope you have a good rest of your Sunday and good rest of your conference. Yeah. Thank you. Sweet. Yeah. It's, it's not half bad. <laughs> good job. Yeah. Thanks, you too. Yeah. Nice to get it on. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Do I need that recorder? Oh, yeah. It's a nice little gadget. Yeah. Of course, thank you.